to do Christmas on December 25th or not to do Christmas on December 25th? That is a question. Now, to some of y'all, y'all probably might be saying, what's that? But where I'm coming from as a minister, it's incredible the amount of fighting and arguing that's going on about Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December. And it's amazing how the enemy will have the church all divided on this particular day when the unsaved of the world, they're, they're fine with it. You know, it's amazing. I want to talk to you just about a few things about Christmas that um, I find and, and feel in my own heart that's very important. And we're going to see that in just a minute. But was Jesus born on the 25th of December? No, I don't think he was. But there is no definitive date in the Bible of when he was born. There's a lot of things that took place that they can start looking at. But one of the things that I think um, we need to, if we're going to understand when he was really born, I personally believe he was born on the Feast of Trumpets. Now there are seven feasts, four of them in the spring, and they were already fulfilled in Christ with his death on the cross and his resurrection and the first fruits and so forth. And Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit. But there's three more that come up in the fall. And in those fall, which are yet to be fulfilled in their entirety, they actually have already been fulfilled spiritually. And so this is why I believe he was born on the Feast of Trumpets. December 25th sounds like a good date to me, even though I believe it was on the Feast of Trumpets. But you don't ever hear me preaching or coming against the fact that it's December 25th. You're going to find out in just a minute why it's a good thing for us to stop arguing about that, right? That we need to stop debating this because the enemy's got the church, the church at odds about what date was he born on. And that's just crazy. And so I want to talk to you this morning just briefly about some things. Uh, number one here is about Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, something like that is pronounced, but anyway, it's the Jewish New Year. Now, here's the deal about the Feast of Trumpets, where I believe he was born on. It really, it really the actual date of the Feast of Trumpets, which is a one-day deal, and they, some say it's a two-day, but it's on a certain day. Now, that day is always moves on the calendar. If you've got a calendar that has some Jewish um, holidays, you're going to see that every year it moves. It could be the end of September sometimes, and it could be the beginning of October. Because the Jews have like three New Year's, and the one of them is, a, is, is the one that involves the Feast of Trumpets and all. And that New Year starts when the priests see a sliver of the moon, and on that day that they see this, the tiniest little sliver of the moon is when that year starts. And that is the Feast of Trumpets. And it's, and it's, it's the trumpet blast sounding the new year, or a change of the old year out and the new year in. And that's why I believe it was the Feast of Trumpets, because of what that feast stands for. It stands for the celebration of out with the old and in with the new, right? And Jesus Christ came to do a whole new thing. He came to fulfill the law, and he came to establish the new covenant, which now we can be born again, we can have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and we can now the gates of heaven have been opened and so forth. So on the Feast of Trumpets, I believe, was that, was that blast of the chauffeur, which we can see here. It's also called the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast begins the Jewish high holy days and 10 days of repentance, or 10 days of awe, with the blowing of the ram's horn, the chauffeur calling God's people to repent from their sins. Now, it's a 10-day deal. That day, and then you count, you count all the way till, till the um, 10 days, actually, and you get to the feast or the day of atonement. And so you have this 10-day period that's called the 10 days of awe. And 10 days in the Jewish faith has to do with a, a time frame until something begins to happen. So what you have is Jesus being seen for 40 days, and then he ascended. And he told them to wait for the promise of the Father. So they raided in that upper room for 10 days. 
Well, what they doing in that 10 days, that 120 people in the upper room? Well, they were believing by faith and hoping by faith. Um, they, were, they were meditating. They were in agreement. They were praying in the temple. And they were making themselves ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which took place 10 days after his ascension. So you got this 10 days of all before you come to the day of atonement, which is the sacrifice. Now, on this day is when the priest, would, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And first he would go in with the blood of a bull. Well, first he actually went in with a, with a, a tray of incense on it. And he would enter in behind the veil, and he would light that and fill that room up with smoke. Because if he didn't do it with the, with the incense, the sweet smell of that, he would have died. So he filled the room up, then he left the Holy Holies, and he went out, and they sacrificed the bull, and he took the blood of that bull, and he went back in. Now some say, in some readings, if you want to study it, they say that they killed the bull and the goat, and he went in with the blood of the bull. But in some teachings, it says that he went out, got the blood of the bull, he went in, went to the mercy seat, and he sprinkled that on the mercy seat, which is a peace offering before God. Then he went back out, and they killed two, well, they killed one goat, and the other goat was, they laid their hands on with sin and released them into the wilderness, which re pretty much represents us. Both of them are Christ, but it represents how we all, we all have escaped from the judgment of sin. And the other goat was, was killed, and then he went in with the blood of that goat, and he did the same thing with the bull. He sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. And that's what they did once a year. Now, some say he had these bells, which he did have bells on the bottom of his garment, and that when God received that sacrifice, he would then ring those bells, and the place would kick in with rejoicing. So the, to all the people who were quiet out there waiting to see if God would receive that. Some said they had a rope tied to his ankle because if he didn't receive it, the priest was dead, and they'd drag him out from under the, <coughs> under the curtain. And then others say, there's nothing about that anywhere. So I don't know, you know, there's so much. There's a lot of Jewish uh, teachings involved in it. But anyway, the Feast of Atonement, or the Day of Atonement, took place. That represented, you got Christ's birth, then you got these 10 days, which then, it was more than 10 days, it was from the time of his birth to his death, he was... 30, about 33 years old, so there's a lot of time there. But that 10 is a symbol and a picture of something about to happen, something that was going to change everything, and it was the sacrifice, once and for all. They never needed to do kill another bull, or another ram, or another goat, another lamb. It didn't have to kill anymore. The sacrifice was complete in Christ. And so you got this picture is what you got, his birth, 10 days, which is the length of time all the way to the cross, and then in that, completely changed. Everybody was under the law, then he died. There's a five-day period in there. We know he was three days, but then there's a five-day period to the Feast of Tabernacles. And in that five days, which is a special number in the Jewish um, uh, realm, they got a lot of special numbers. But in that is a fulfillment, and when the fulfillment of time then came, then came Christ rising from the dead, and then began to tabernacle among us. But there was another thing about it, too. The Feast of Tabernacles, which was on the 15th of Tezra, I believe how you say that. The Feast of Tabernacles is the most joyous of all the fall fest, feast. It is one of three biblical pilgrim feasts when Jewish males, because they brought their families, were directed to appear before the Lord. This meant the people traveled to Jerusalem to build and dwell in their booths. They actually, um, when, they were, when they came out of Egypt, when Moses brought them out of Egypt, they tabernacled in the wilderness on the shelters. And this is a re, kind of a reenactment of it. It was all spiritual, it had a meaning behind it. And God walked among them as they tabernacled. And the Lord came in his body. Some say he was born on the Feast of Tabernacles because God is tabernacled among the people in his tent, in his body. That you and I live in a body, he was living in the body also. But actually what takes place on this day is the ingathering. And, and they're gathered, all the men come to Jerusalem. And they come with joy and excitement. Resurrection. And, it, and it, everything that comes with that resurrection. 
And so they reenacted this thing every year, every year, every year. And it was fulfilled in Christ when he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Amen? Anybody understand what I'm saying? I hope, you know. And uh, it's, it's in the Bible. The seven festivals are described in the Bible. We talk about how long they got to go on, how many animals they had to kill, and on and on it went. And so that's why I believe that Jesus Christ was born to feast of trumpets. Now, you see, you, you basically can't nail it down to any particular day because it's actually the first day of the new year. But on our calendar... It could be September uh, 27, 28, 29th, 30th. It could be beginning of October when they see that sliver of moon. So it's always moving, you know. And I think God did that for a reason. If that was the case, I think he did it for a reason. You know why? Because we celebrate his birth on the 25th of December. But actually we as Christians, we always are celebrating his birth, his death, and his resurrection. And so, even though it's, it's been nailed down. Now, some, I was talking to a young man, and he's on fire for the Lord, and he was looking up some stuff. And, he, and, he got, and when we got talking, and he got me on the side, and, and he said, man, he said, um, you know, I heard that Christmas is modeled after some pagan thing. And I said, look, look, I know that. And just about all the stuff at, from the Catholic Church, I'm not putting down the Catholic, I'm just saying, with Constantine, what they did was they took a lot of dates that people were worshiping false gods and all and began to transfer them over to Mary and saints and, and of course, Christmas Day. It's actually having to do with the sun god. And, uh, and I said, you know, but let me tell you something. I said, here's where we got to be as Christians. We have to be very, very careful about how we handle this. There was a time in my life when I first started reading and discovering the same stuff that he was, that he was pretty much talking to me about. And I, um, and I started to think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start having Christmas, uh, my Christmas with my family on the Feast of Trumpets. But the Lord checked me on that. And I never did do that. And I'm going to show you a few reasons. There's three reasons why we should not fight it. We shouldn't press in against this. You know, and, and I'm having this thought in my mind that it's not the world out there that's having a problem. It's us. And the world sees this. You know, I, I, um, I watched a video a couple of weeks ago and on YouTube, and it says in, in this, the, the man that did it, and he said, stop bashing Christmas. And he talked about reasons why, and I watched it. It was about a 10-minute video. And I found it very interesting, and everything he said was my viewpoint also. And so I definitely agreed with it about tradition and so forth. And uh, he talked about whether people want to put a tree up or not, or, or we used the tree and used the stars. And it was the star that guided the wise. We turned it into something holy for our children, and we're doing it for our grandkids. Because Christmas is in our face. And when you start attacking it and you start trying to change things, you're going to breed confusion. But a couple of weeks ago, after I watched that video, my, my grandson, sitting in the back, was, had their Christmas concert at Shelman High. He played a solo, which we're trying to get him to do here, but he's telling me no. He played Solid Night on the grand piano in front of two audiences, Thursday night and Friday night. So we were there on Thursday night, Julie and I. We're sitting on about the second row, so we're looking up at everybody. And, uh, and the choir came out. They had different things that they did. And one of them was they had this choir. It was made up of about 30 to 40 kids. I counted 34, and then they moved, so I think it was more than that. But they had at least 34 kids. And they were singing about Jesus. They were singing about the Christ, our Savior, on the, in the song. It's a Christmas song. And I was sitting there listening to them, and I was being overwhelmed because the song has great meaning to me as a Christian. But I thought as I sat there, how many of those kids go to church? Parents bring them to church. They even know 
whom they're singing about. And I sat there and I just kind of looked around, looked at all these kids. They were in perfect harmony. I mean, I would have had a struggle just to hear the individual one sing because they, they had practiced and practiced and practiced. And I mean, they nailed this song down, the sopranos and the, and the bass and all of them. I mean, and the baritones, they were, they were beautiful. They, it was great. I mean, I was, that had to be the best I ever heard a Christmas song sang, I'll be honest with you. I mean, they would, I would, that brought them right up with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I mean, they were, they were up there. <laughs> so, and I almost began to cry because there was a lot of truth I was seeing here. First, I had just finished watching that video. And what he said on that video was exactly what I was seeing right there on the spot. How many of those kids believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet they were singing about him? And when they finished, people were clapping and cheering. And, and I don't know if they were standing and all, but we were clapping. And they were just awesome. And I thought, I know they're clapping for the kids singing. But these, these could be unsaved people that all year long, they say GD and they use Jesus' name in vain. And, and they curse and they, and they put us down and laugh at us and mock us. But one time a year, it's like the truth comes up, the, you know. We're having this ceasefire for a little while. And they seem to cross over to our side and sing about God. And sing about Silent Night. That was, man, that was the night Jesus was born. You know, our Savior was born. And they did the whole show. And they had, the, I don't even think there was a pandemic anymore because we were like this. Especially when we left the auditorium. It's like, I told Joe, I said, I don't think there's a pandemic anymore. They packed us in here like sardines. Two nights in a row they did that. So my thought was exactly what that video I had saw, what that man was saying, and I totally agree with it. You know, now at the holidays, they don't glorify Christ like that, even Easter. You know, there's, not a lot of, there's no songs that I know about maybe, about his resurrection, I'm sure. But they don't, do, they don't do specials. They don't do the choirs in the schools. They don't sing anything at Easter time. Christmas time. Even the unsaved, even the atheists, they know that it's about Christ. Halloween, different ball game altogether. Mardi Gras, different ball game. All the gods and the false gods. You know what I'm saying? But Christmas. But then who's the ones doing the fighting? It's not the atheists. It's not the unbelievers. They're not saying, shut this Christmas time down. We don't want this stuff no more. They don't boycott it. They go buy more presents and give them out for Christmas. They try to dilute it with whatever they do, but they, don't, they can't get around the fact that that's the day we celebrate. And one guy said, hey, but it's on the pagan holiday. I said, no, it isn't. You can, you can interview everybody in this place right now, and I could interview you, and I could say, What's the name of the pagan god that that day is honoring? And there might be one or two, and you hear might tell me it has to do with the sun god. But the rest of y'all will go, I don't know. Why? Because you at Christmas time do not think about the sun god of the sun, you know, to him. You're thinking about, it's about Jesus. So who are the ones fighting? It's the church. The church is fighting about it. And it's getting worse, you know. You go back before the internet and all, you heard little things here and there, but now it's on the internet, it's everywhere. And people out there can, can listen to the church fighting over it. They're fighting over everything nowadays. The church is beating each other up. Some witness we are. So three reasons why. Number one, people sing songs about Jesus. That's amazing. You know, even some of the unsaid don't even believe in them go Christmas carol. And you, if you was asked them why, they say, because it's fun. You know, their, their heathen group will go out and knock on doors and sing Christmas carols. That's amazing to me. Almost knocked your plan over. Sing songs about Jesus. It's the only time of the year that the heathen, the unsaved person out there, will compromise their beliefs and sing. Isn't that amazing? Number two, people care about one another a little more at that time of the year. They spread good joy. They, they began to 
think about, what, about their family and all that they might not even think about all year long. It's Christmas time. Something happens at Christmas. Say, that's your Christmas spirit. Well, if there's a spirit involved, it's the Holy Spirit. And if he's doing anything on this earth, he's definitely taking advantage of the day. Amen? Amen? Yes. Or we? And number three, Christians remind and teach their children and grandchildren about Jesus. Maybe not all. Maybe it's not nailed down at that time to read the Christmas story or something like that. But Christians will be praying, talking to the kids, talking about Jesus, different things. Uh, churches will have skits and plays, and people that never, be, never come to church at all will be invited, and they'll show up and come here by Jesus. Maybe never come back to church. I hope they come back, but because the doors are open, and God loves them. But I'm just saying, it's just... It's a Christian mindset. Even if we don't say something direct, we still imply in it by the way we're living. And kids are picking it up. You ask, you ask the kid, what's, what's so great about Christmas? Presents. Well, as Christian family, we show them how the greatest gift is Jesus. And if you don't set a tree up, that's fine. But if you do, you can use the tree. Jesus Christ was crucified on a tree. They cut the tree down and made a cross and nailed him to that. You know, the lights that surrounded are you and I as we glorify the fact that he died. This is what I told my kids. The tinsel, the ornaments, these are all golden treasures of attributes of God. And when we, when we deck out the tree, there's so many ornaments on it, we don't even know where to hang them. Because my thinking is, we, we don't have enough bulbs and ornaments for all the attributes of God. And the star, exactly what that young man said. He said, I used, to, I used to set up a tree and put a star on it. But then I found out, you know, I said, yeah, I can take care of the Old Testament. It says they go out and chop the tree down, bring it in the house, decorate it, and bow down to it as God. I said, but that's not what we're doing. That's not what's being done at Christmas time. Come on, let's be truthful with ourselves. We enjoy in the season, lights, tinsel, all this stuff. It's just a, a, a light flickering in the darkness, or it can be something more elaborate. Depends on what you do with it. Depends on what we do with it. Depends on what we say about it and how we identify with it. Amen? Amen. What would happen if we try to change this date? What if the church rose up and said, he's not born on that date? And first off, the unsaved are going to go, then what date was he born? Because they all arguing about that. You go on the internet, you'll find every one of the festivals, that's, that's when, look, this happened. And, you know, and then I'll say, okay, let's say it's, a, it's the festival. But the festival dates, they don't move on their calendar, but they definitely move. So what's the actual date on her calendar? We know it's the 25th of December. If it's the Feast of Trumpets, like I said, or atonement, or tabernacles, they are on certain, exactly certain dates of their Jewish month, Tishra, I think it is, 1st, 10th, I think, and then the 15th, those three. Some even say, and this isn't even one of the main festivals, it's Hanukkah. It's celebration of lights. The, de the dedication of the temple, the Feast of Hanukkah. That didn't come into being until the Maccabean brothers did a revolt and they didn't have any oil for the lamp and for nine days, God kept the lamp lit. So that's why sometimes you see that non-candle menorah instead of the seven that we normally see. It's, for, it's, a, it's a menorah for Hanukkah. The, day, the celebration of lights they say, well, he was born on that day. One guy said, if it's a feast of trumpets and you're having a problem with December 25th, it's a good chance he might have been conce conceived on the 25th and then was born eight months later on the feast of trumpets. But the conception was from God, not from man. Amen? So what would happen if we tried to change the date? Major confusion. I hope I spelled that right. Did I spell that right? 
major confusion because the ones that would be trying to change it was the church. The very one that, rep, you know, it's Christ, it's about him, and we're trying to change it because we're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna worship our Savior on that pagan day. Well, it's, if it's a pagan day, it's because you are making it a pagan day. You know, it's not a pagan day to me. You know, so they're fighting about different things in the church right now, about church on Saturday. We still gotta honor the Sabbath and all the other laws of the old covenant. And I, it just makes me upset because Sabbath is a day of rest. Hebrews 4 says there still remains a rest for the people of God. Had Joshua give the true rest, then why is there still another rest? But Jesus gave the true rest. So it's no longer a day every day. I don't rest on one day. I'm at rest in the Lord every day. Amen. So there's no more days. Jesus eliminated it. It's the day of the Lord. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is where I live in that true. Why are we fighting over this stuff? People don't even want to go to church anymore because they hear the fighting and they hear all the other stuff that's going on and foolishness and money and all that kind of stuff. And so people are pulling away. And, I mean, you can go read it yourself, the statistics. They are pulling away. The numbers of evangelicals are falling. People are leaving the churches. Why? Because they're just tired of it. They're tired of them constantly wanting money out of them. They're tired of the bashing of the other ministries. They're tired of the tearing down. They're tired of the laws. When the Lord, Lord saved me, he broke the chains of legalism and set me free. But the church has been trying to bring me back under some laws. Sometimes they're not even biblical laws. They're just, they're just assembly of God law that we are. So I tolerate. There's no way, anywhere you go, you're not going to find a perfect church anyway. So we tolerate. Number two, it just would never happen. You'd be fighting until the Lord comes. It's not going to change. Or you're going to wind up having two Christmases or three or four, or ten. Because if we nail it down to the Feast of Trumpets, which then we move it every time, every year, then some other group is going to say, no, he was born on Tabernacle, so now we're going to have another Christmas. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Hey, man, it doesn't matter to me what day it is. 25th sounds pretty good to me. So I'm going to take advantage of the situation. Take advantage of... It's Christmas. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's have peace on earth and peace in our relationship. Let's love one another. That's what Christ came to do. Bring love. Number three, nobody would care. You know who? The only ones that would care would be those church people. The world's going to do it on December 25th. They're going to continue to do what they're doing. And the light of the gospel is going to be diminished because the ones that should be worshiping on that day are fighting and they're out, of, they're out of the picture. So anyway, that's the last point I got. How you like that? It's almost, almost 12 anyway. But the truth of the matter is, is that God sent his son to the earth to fulfill the law, to do everything that was needed to be done. All you and I have to do is accept him. And then you, when you're accepting him, you're accepting a fulfillment of the law. So you don't have to do legalistic things. Of course, you need to stop sinning, but that even comes by the help and power of the Holy Spirit, who then begins to show you where you need to change, and if you would let him, he'll help you to change, become a better person. You know, if there is no God, then we all just die. But if there is a God, then we don't all just die. You understand what I'm saying? If I'm right, then some people will wind up in hell because they rejected Christ. But if I'm wrong, we just all die. And it's over with. I believe I'm right. I have to, because I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, you know. I got saved in my bedroom. The Lord made himself real to me. 
He takes care of me, he speaks to my heart, and guides me into all righteousness. Amen. I have peace, I have joy, I have contentment, and look, if there is no God, what I have is awesome. But that is proof, because I was nothing more than a... <laughs> I had anger out of this world, hatred, bitterness, hated my dad, smoked, drank, curse, drug. And I don't do any of that. And I fell in love with my dad. So if there is no God, hey, I'm having a good life. Amen. 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 Yes. Delivered from all that stuff. And now I'm happy. I'm not angry anymore. I can get angry. You cut me off on the road, see what happens. <laughs> I'll say, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> what else can I say? I don't curse anymore. So I just got to pray for them because they don't know what they're doing. Amen. Amen. Stand on your feet, please, and let's close out in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you for this wonderful day. And I just pray that everybody in here and, and out there in the church world will get on the same page. Let's take advantage of the situation. Let's love one another. Let's identify with Christ so the world might see that we love one another and they will know that we are your disciples. But Father, we pray that all the fighting and all the trash will just be thrown out we we'll understand who's stirring things up, and it definitely is not God. Because God made it to where we really don't know the birth date. So there have to be, has to be a reason why you've done that, Lord. And that's because every day we need to celebrate. Celebrate the birth of Christ. So, Father, we give you all the praise this morning. And all the glory and honor belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Merry Christmas.